you like to lead us to start us off in a prayer? I'd love to. Dear Lord God, where two or more are gathered together, we know you're with us. And we, we thank you for being with us here this evening. Um, I don't know what we're going to discuss tonight, but to be honest, it doesn't matter. We're going to share in your spirit and your joy, Lord. Amen. 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 Well, let's do this. I, you know, I, I really don't want to go on into the study that I kind of thought about because I, I'd like other people to participate in it and not miss it. But I, I said that one of the reasons uh, that we are on this trip is I really felt the Lord speaking to me about going in search of Christianity. Right. The, the fact is, there are in the United States of America, there are over 300,000 churches, congregations. Mm -hmm. Excluding things like Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons, and I mean, just what what is considered normally considered Christianity. <clears throat> That's three hundred thousand congregations. A lot, a lot of people. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know what the number is here in the UK, but the UK is culturally a very Christian nation. Okay. The question becomes: Does God see this as Christianity? What What is Christianity? You know, is it that building on the corner? Uh, because if you, if you look at the building here that has the British flag flying high from its turret yeah. on the top, and then you come into a little Pentecostal church, you'll see that they're very, very different, right? Yeah. I mean, the, the ceremonies, the services, the, the, the structure is, is so varied. Well, can they both be Christianity? Or... Are, is one of them Christianity and one of them not? Are they both missing something? You know, well, one is one is possibly uh, is dead. <laughs> well, well, the I, I would the say side. that it's not the church, the building, whatever denomination it is. Mm -hmm. I would say it's the spirit of the people. Mm. When you say the spirit of the people, well, okay. all right, I'll rephrase that. The belief, uh, yeah, um, how firmly they believe and what they actually do about it. Okay, but the question I was going to ask you yeah. is, when you say the people, yes. are you talking about Ralph and Joe and Jane and yes, Mary, or about... are you talking about them as a unit, a congregation? Right. No, I, oddly enough, I wasn't. I was which talking okay, which about people, yeah. individual. people individual, because um, there can be ten people at the church, and there can be one who's absolutely solidly with God in everything they do, and others who just turn up. So I don't think you can... I would hate to judge you... Well, I'm not a judge, but um, if you asked me to judge a group, I couldn't do it. I could only judge individuals. Um, and I would hope that God does the same, but it's not for me to say what God does either. Well, let's talk about that, because that's, yeah. a, see, that's a good point. Because we are, you know... God is no respecter of men. We are individuals. He has yeah. called us by name. We yeah. each have an individual relationship with Him. But yeah. we are corporately the body of Christ. Yeah. So God does see us as a whole. We're supposed to be operating as a whole. Okay, yeah. So that I, I believe that God looks at a congregation and sees that as a a being, so to speak. Okay. Now obviously there's two different levels working. I, I recognize um, that there there are individuals. You can go into one church that is spiritually dead, and there may be a person in there who is alive. But perhaps this is the person that God is speaking to when He speaks that verse that says, "Come out from their midst and be separate." And be be separate. Separate, right? Yeah. Okay. Because we're supposed to be a the church. Okay, let's do this again. In order to go in search of Christianity, in order to see to find church. Yes. You have to be able to define it. Yes. You have to know what it looks like. Mm. I mean, how can you go looking for something if you don't know what it looks like? Okay. You know, there's, there's got to be that togetherness. Okay, so, but I mean, we need to understand. It's like, if you ask me to go, can you run to the store and buy me an asparagus? Mm -hmm. I might have a hard time because I'm not quite sure what an asparagus looks like. Okay. 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 I have to know what it looks like. I have to be able to define it. I have to be able to say, okay, when I, when I see it, I've got to be able to recognize it. Yes. Well, the same thing holds true then of Christianity. Yeah. It should be definable. It should be recognizable. Mm -hmm. you, yes. You, I, I, okay. I, 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 I am. 
Um, because I'm very simplistic and I try and knock things down to its most simplistic. So my simplistic thought of Christianity is people who believe in God. It's as blunt as that. Hi Charles. Charles. Yeah. Hey. Praise the Lord. Mind relaxing sit down. Have a seat. Yourself, brother. God bless you. Good to see you, brother. You're just in the nick of time, brother. Come on. <laughs> just you know, yeah, man. <laughs> I do need You're all right. Yes, thank you. Uh, okay. You relaxed? You ready? Yeah. You're all set? You charged up? Mm -hmm. I'm going to turn the on switch on. Okay. okay. We are sitting here and we're discussing what Christianity is, how you define it, how you recognize it. Okay? And, and we're just in the process of saying, you know, is it... Can you recognize it by a building? Can you recognize it by a congregation? The building down the street with a big flag flying from the roof is very, very much different than the building that we're in. And congregationally, the mix is very, very much different. I think you'll find the traditions and the cultures are very, very different. So, and Tim is saying, okay, you, your comment was, you're very simplistic, it's a bunch. Well, you're, what you're doing is you are creating a definition. Yes, I'm aware of that. Yeah. Okay. The word church, I agree with you 100%. I don't think it can be defined any other way correctly than to say it is an assembly, a gathering of believers. Mm -hmm. In the name, people who, two or more, who have gathered in the name of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. That's how, how the Word of God defines <coughs> church. It's a gathering of believers. <coughs> Literally, the Greek word that's used in the Bible is a cleave. <coughs> and that, that, that means the, the called. It was, it was a term that referred, for example, in Greece to the what Senate. Word, sorry. Ecclesia. Uh, ecclesiastic. Right, that's where the word comes from. That yeah. Ecclesiastic, yeah. ecclesiastical, all of those words, that's where it comes from. Ecclesial, ecclesiastic, ecclesiastic. No, ecclesiastic. But it comes from the Greek word ecclesia, mm -hmm. which is a gathering of, of people who have been called. Well, we are gathered because we have been called by the Lord, called by name. That was the thing we talked about the other night. Yeah. So you're defining a church, okay? And that to me is an acceptable definition of a church is a gathering of believers, okay? Uh, does anybody have, you have a problem with that? You look a little quizzical, Charles. No, I'm all right. Okay. <laughs> I was just still running. All together, so okay. you're still all right. So I would say then, because this is a debatable thing and it's a silly debate to get into, when did the church start? In the garden? Well, you just jumped right in there, didn't you? Because a lot of people would say on the day of Pentecost, but my answer to that is the first church was in the Garden of Eden. Because it was a gathering of believers gathered not only in the name of right, the Lord, yeah. but they were gathered in the presence of God. The presence, yeah. okay. So you had, you had two believers gathered in the presence of God. That's the first church. Okay? okay. But my question was not, it didn't start by saying, okay, how do we find church? My question was, how do we define Christianity? Right, and I said, well, my definition would church. be, um, well, I thought I said those who believe in God. Did I not? I you, said, you said those, believers. I, you may have been something like that. But, okay. but Christianity, it's almost like the, pra first of all, you know, just to make this a little more complicated. <laughs> Christianity is not a term that you find in the Bible other than it was a name applied by non-believers to the believers. Right. The, the, the believers never called themselves Christians. They might have called themselves, they, they did call themselves followers of the way, followers of Jesus, disciples, a lot, a lot of things. Um, but they never, one of the things that never happened was they never separated them from the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They never they never separated themselves from the Jewish religion. What they did do, and this is clear, is separated themselves from the way it was practiced in the natural. That it wasn't about what transpired in the flesh, it was what transpired in the spirit. Mm -hmm. And by the way, that's not New Testament. That's Old Testament. Mm -hmm. You know, it was the, the symbol of Judaism, since Judaism has existed, has been circumcision. Mm -hmm. Right? But way back when, in, in the law, God spoke and He said that they were to be circumcised. He said to them, commanded them, circumcise the foreskins of your heart. 
Right? It was always an inward thing, a spiritual thing, and there are outward symbols mm -hmm. that proclaim what's going on in our lives. Mm -hmm. But those outward things are not what make things happen. Mm -hmm. They just be speak of what has happened spiritually. Mm -hmm. I'll use the example of baptism. Mm -hmm. Baptism comes <coughs> from, the, from the Greek word, baptismeo, which means to be washed. Mm -hmm. It literally means to be washed. But getting dunked in the Jordan doesn't wash you clean of your sins. Mm -hmm. It can't cleanse your sins. There's no water on earth except the living water of Jesus Christ that can cleanse your sin. There's an old song, What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So baptism doesn't clean you, but baptism is a proclamation to the world that you have been cleaned yeah. by the blood of the Lamb. Right? Yeah. It is a symbol of an inward event, an inward happening. That you're saying to the world, to everybody, that, that I have been washed clean by the blood of the Lamb. And, and it's symbolic of being buried in the water and then rising out of the water. It's symbolic of dying and coming forth into new life. Right? You know, Paul says in Romans that if we, if we believe in our hearts and confess with our mouth. Okay? So, it's, what, the core of that is what you believe in your heart. But it results in an action that you confess it. That you say, you believe in your heart, you confess with your mouth. Yeah. You've been washed clean by the blood of the Lamb. Now you are baptized to show that, to proclaim it, to say to the world, look what, look what God has done in my life. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of that. Now, the Jewish religion was because of the hardness of their heart that a lot of the law exists. The law can be broken up into three parts. If you look at this, if you can just take Ten Commandments as an example. The first commandments have wow. to do with your relationship with God. Mm. You shall have no other gods before me. Right? right? Mm. So they have to do with your relationship with God. Well, the balance of them basically have to do with your relationship with man. To honor your mother and father. To not covet your neighbor's goods. To not kill your, you know, anybody. So part of those laws are about your relationship with God, which comes first. And part of the law has to do with your relationship with man. Mm -hmm. Now, if you go on into the law, the Torah, which is what they call the first five books of the, the Bible, I, I'll say that the law is broken into three parts. About your relationship with God, your relationship with other people. And the third thing is about your own well-being. Mm -hmm. There were dietary laws. God didn't say that you can't eat ham and cheese out in the wilderness in a desert because it was some kind of pleasing sacrifice to him. He said, this isn't safe. Mm -hmm. I mean, he gave us laws that protect us from ourselves. Mm -hmm. He created laws that, that create a right relationship with him, a right relationship with others, and a right relationship with ourselves. Mm -hmm. Okay? But you can't achieve righteousness through the law. That's what it says. Mm -hmm. Not only are you incapable of achieving righteousness through the law, we can't even keep the law because of our fallen human nature. Mm -hmm. It says that there's none good, no, not even one. We've all broken the law. Mm -hmm. It is impossible for us human beings not to have broken the law. There's one, something I was reading. About, there were so many laws, you know, it's like 600 and yeah. whatever Jewish right. laws. Yeah. yeah, there are. And there are 1,500 canon laws in the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. So that's the truth. They've made more laws than the Jews ever thought of. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know how can, this, this is a, that's kind of taking us. But that's kind of you know where I go with this. If you define Christianity, Christianity is not the law. Christianity, and let's just play with this, right? I would say what we call Christianity, right, for, for lack of a better term, it is first and foremost a relationship with God the Father. Yeah. Right. That relationship with God the Father is made possible through the atoning work of Jesus Christ. Yeah. He said, no man comes to the Father but through me. Yes. And you are drawn to Jesus Christ by the Father and the Holy Spirit. Yes. So the, the three parts of the Godhead, as we say, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are all involved in it. Question. Yeah. Why can't we simplify it and just say Christianity is 
the belief in God by individuals? Because it's got to be more than just a belief. It says okay. even right. even if demons believe. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. Yeah. So it ha it has to. Um, you know, James in his letter says when you talk about belief, uh, I'll use the word faith. Yes. Sir. And he talks about faith, and he says faith without works is dead, being by itself. Yeah, right. So it has to result in some kind of action. It has to result yeah. Yeah. when when you're given new when when you come to that. I, I said the first thing that Christianity is is a relationship with God the Father, right? Which can only be achieved by the atoning work of Jesus Christ. Yeah. So you, because of what He's done. Christianity is first and foremost new life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. You've been given new life. Yeah. New life should require a new lifestyle. Yeah. Mm -hmm. A new way of living. And the New Testament is just absolutely filled with that concept. Mm -hmm. To put on a new man. To put off the old man. Yeah. To, to start walking in the newness, the fullness of life. Because we were missing all of this. All right? mm -hmm. So, but if we say... And if, if, if there's any problem with this, I mean, let's bat this around. Because, you know, I'm still trying to work all this out in my own head, so I have a greater understanding of it. But we, this is such dangerous ground. We give all honor and glory to Jesus Christ. But Christianity is, first of all, about our relationship with the Father. Yes. And sometimes we ignore the Father. You know. I don't understand. Because okay. you know they're three in one. So no, they are three in one. <coughs> yeah. Okay. okay, but but so how can we if, if we're even talking about Jesus Christ, how can we ignore the Father? God? Yeah. Well, it, it is possible. I mean, okay. it, it, there's a subtle difference here. Now, let me okay. just tell you something about the devil. Yeah. Right. The very very first revelation of the devil in the Bible is in the third chapter of Genesis, mm -hmm. and the very first thing that we're told about our enemy is that he was more crafty or more subtle than any other beast of the field. Yes, okay. So we have to be careful of these subtle things that go on, right? Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. Jesus always pointed us to the Father. Yes. When he, when he taught us, when, he, when you pray, pray this way, our Father. Yes. There are a lot of congregations in the, in, in the world today that don't like, for whatever reason, the Holy Spirit. Yes. They don't believe that, that the work yes. of the Holy Spirit is for today. So they kind of put him aside. You can't do that. You can't pick and choose what part of God yes, you want. Right. You can't come to the Father without yeah. Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. You can't get to the, Jesus Christ without the, the Holy Spirit convicting you and, and bringing yes. you into that relationship. And the Father will always, He has sent the Spirit to lead us into all truth. The truth is Jesus Christ and it goes around and around and around. Yes. It goes. But there is this balance of focus. Uh, that that we have, you know, that we can't ignore one part of God. That's what I'm saying. Yes, yes. And sometimes we do. We become fixated. There are there are congregations, for example, that I believe are just fixated on the Holy Spirit, for example, okay. yes. to the exclusion. Of it. It's it's like this. It gets out of balance. Okay. It says twice in the Book of Proverbs that an unjust balance is an abomination to the Lord. Okay. And it, all of this just has to be kept in okay. balance. But the purpose of Jesus Christ. Remember. It says, for God, it's talking about the Father. For the Father, God so loved the world that He sent His only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, into yes. the world. This begins with the love of the Father. Yes. Okay? Remember, the Trinity is a mystery. So, can't understand. dare not sit here tonight and ask me to explain the Trinity. Because I have, I can't, I can't do that. I'm not going to ask you no, 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 that except that it's, yeah. Yeah. that's it. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. It's, it's, it's a mystery. Yeah. And by the way, a mystery is not what they tell you on television. You know, it's a problem to be solved in 30 minutes or 60 minutes. Yeah. A mystery, biblically, is something that's just beyond our comprehension. Okay. You know, we can't, just we just accept. can't get it here yeah, so on this planet. Right? Yes, and there are those right. mysteries. So, this whole thing, everything, starts with the love of the Father that causes Him to send Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, who has a willingness to be obedient to the, to the will of the Father. And he comes, he empties himself, Paul says in Philippians chapter 2, and comes into the world. So this is what restores us and brings us into the fold. Mm -hmm. Now, in theory, I was a Christian. I got saved on my 33rd birthday. So for that would make, mean that I had passed, how does this work? For, for 33 years, mm -hmm. I had been, quote-unquote, a Christian. 
because I was born into a Catholic family mm -hmm. that believes in infant baptism. Mm -hmm. And since they, in, they baptize you as an infant, that what they're saying is, okay, now you're part of the household of God. Yeah. Not because of any choice you made, not because of any decision you made, but because you were born into this family that's part of that, right? Uh -huh. um, this was one of the great debates in the early, early Reformation church, you know, that nobody can decide, it says, no man can by any means redeem his brother. You, nobody else can redeem you. Nobody else can bring you into the household again. It was the same in the Church of England, the Church of England well, yeah. but at age 13, you confirmed. You're and what that is you yes. say, hey, I believe in God. Yeah. Is that what it means? Yes. That's well, let me just tell you this. I did graduate work in a Catholic seminary. Yeah. And C of E is just Catholic light. It's Catholic without the Pope. Yeah, and, yeah, and yeah Without, without yeah. Peter's Pence. Yeah. Um, I studied sacramental theology okay. on a graduate level, right, yeah. and I will tell you that in that in the courses of sacramental, we couldn't figure out what confirmation was. Okay. Well, it's, the simplistic view is that your parents, when you're one or whatever, and you get baptized, make promises on your behalf, and at 13 you say, "Yes, I'm taking those promises on my own head, and I believe in God." That's the gist. I mean, you're actually wrong. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah, yeah. All right. What it's supposed to be in theology is yeah. the impartation of the Holy Spirit. Okay, all right. That's that's the theology. Yeah. Of, that's that is sacramental theology. Right. That that you have become part of the household of God. Yeah. Because the Catholic Church and C of E, I mean, yeah. you know, they, they are they, <coughs> their basic theology is the same. Mm -hmm. Is that you now have a relationship with God because you have a relationship with the Church. Okay. Baptism doesn't make what baptism does is it makes you part of the church. Yes. That's your entrance into the church. Right. So and you then, go through the church before right. you get to God. And you need yeah. the, okay. you, you get to God through the church. Okay. All yeah. right. At, at age thirteen, because in the Catholic Church it's the same thing, you have this process of uh, the sacrament they call confirmation. Right. Which is supposed to be the impartation of the Holy Spirit. Yes. However, I, and I, I as I say, I went to a Catholic seminary. And I assume that the theology is still the same in the CV, yeah. Church of England for you, mm -hmm. is that, that uh, this is when the Holy Spirit is imparted to you, so you have the yeah. strength. Okay. You, it, and it comes from basically Jewish law yeah. of at 13 you're a man. Yeah. In, in the Jewish families they have what they call bar mitzvah yeah. at 13 years old. And at 13 years old, a, a Jewish child, a, a boy child, they have bat mitzvah for the for nice. the girls. Mm -hmm. But the bar mitzvah is that you are now you're you are accountable for everything. You're an adult. Right. Yeah. yeah. So you're spiritually an adult. Bar mitzvah is the word bar means son, mm -hmm. and mitzvah is the law. Yeah, so you have become a son of the law. Yeah. You have you have now become part of that. Right. The problem with all of this yeah. is that. That's backwards theology. And what's backwards about it is this. Your relationship with God, your relationship with the church does not create your relationship with God. That's backwards. It's your relationship with God that makes you part of the church, not, not vice versa. But the teaching of the Catholic Church, the teaching of the Anglican Church, the Church of England, the Greek Orthodox Church, the Russian Orthodox Church, all involves this infant baptism, which was a great controversy in the early church. Because the theology is backwards, it's saying when you when you become part of the church, that creates your relationship with God, and it's upside down and backwards. Yeah. Okay, I mean, you understand what I'm saying? It's when you accept, when you create, when you come to Jesus Christ and accept His atoning work, what He did for you on the cross, that creates your relationship with God the Father. Yeah, there was something about that. What well, have you been saying that? Being in, in the church from from being young, and and then you know, like I had, a, I remember having a a baptism certificate, mm -hmm. and like there was Godfather. Oh yeah, yeah. oh yeah, Godfather, you know, and Godmother and Godfather, mm -hmm. and yeah. then uh, well, I I was a bit younger. I was like twelve, uh, probably like eleven or twelve. Um, I was confirmed, you know, and but it was like. I didn't really understand what they were doing. You know, nobody I mean, does. I wasn't a, Dave, I wasn't that's what I'm trying to tell you. I, I mean, yeah, I, I, when I served, you know, I was like boat boy, I was, you know, thoroughfare, I was, you know, um, I was MC, you know, to, 
to, to the priest and you know, altar boy is that yeah yeah altar boy yeah. yeah but you see you're not alone I, what I'm saying to you is nobody understands yeah, yeah. what well, I'm not being facetious now when I say that I study on a graduate level I sacramental still theology I still, still didn't know and I'm, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm yeah. here exactly. I'm yeah. here mixing with theologians <coughs> yeah. and they can't explain confirmation mm -hmm. Because it has, whatever me, meaning it had in the beginning and as a church sacrament, it is certainly nothing that you can find in Scripture. Mm. You understand that? Mm. Mm. It's not to be found in Scripture. Mm. It is a tradition of men. Mm. And it was created for some reason. Mm. But now, all of a sudden, that reason has been lost in the, in the ages, all right? That they don't have a great understanding of it. So you could not have had an understanding of it because nobody's going to give you, there's nobody who can give you that understanding. Because they didn't understand it. They don't really understand it. Yeah. When I was confirmed, we had to go to confirmation class, and it was about yes. ten right. hour long sessions. And the vicar um, was explaining stuff and about explain God. Yeah. And uh, I say again because I'm repeating what I said earlier. I got into my head that you, that the whole point of the confirmation was to say yes, um, I love God, I agree with God, I'm going to follow God. Um, so it was really saying what I think your parents had said. 10 years previously. Yeah, the, the problem with that is yeah. that that is not what the, the theology teaches. Right, that, yeah. And what, what happens is because the meaning is lost, yeah. you can, you know, you start to get all these different explanations in everything yes. that none of which have any certainty. Okay. Okay. The, the fact is, how do you enter into new life? Jesus, a man named a religious leader mm -hmm. who had no understanding of anything, mm -hmm. <coughs> whose name was Nicodemus. <coughs> came to Jesus in the night because he didn't want to be seen by others right. in John chapter 3. And he starts to ask Jesus questions and Jesus just, Chum, let's cut to the chase. Mm -hmm. He said, you must be born again. Right. Mm -hmm. And Nicodemus, now, you know, we've heard this term over and over and over. Mm -hmm. I promise you, up until that point, Never. nobody heard this term, yeah. you got to be born again. Yeah. And Nicodemus says, well, I'm going to go back yeah. into my mother. Wait, you know, what are you mm -hmm. talking about? So Jesus then answers this way. He says, For God, the Father, right? Yeah. Loved the world so much that He gave His only begotten Son, yeah. so that whosoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. Yeah. Well, your entrance into the relationship with the Father comes when you choose to believe in the salvation provided by Jesus Christ. Yeah. Mm. You didn't do that as an infant. No, no. You didn't do exactly, that yes. because somebody stood there and poured water, water over your forehead, <coughs> yeah. or and you had and and nobody can do that on your behalf. That's the point. Mm. They, they can't believe for you. For you, no. It's like they forced it. Yeah, they didn't. Know. What they promised was that they would do their best to bring their child up. That's very nice. The best they could, believing in God, and would try and help their child. So it wasn't that they said, well, yeah, they, they were trying to do the best for the child, but they, they weren't saying, I guarantee this child will believe in God. They no, were no, saying, no, no, we'll do you, our best. But see, yes, here's where you're going off track. Okay, okay? Yeah. You're, you're thinking that the ceremony is about believing in God. Yeah. It is about, this is what, this is what enters you into the roles of the church. Okay. Remember. Right. When, you, yeah. Yeah. when you are baptized yeah. as an infant, you have become a member of the church. Okay, right. That's not, it was never based on your belief. belief in God. Right. Well, thanks for clarifying that, because I, right. I was off right. on that. It was, it's not based on your consent, it's not based on your belief in God, it is based on this ceremony, yeah. because the priest has the power, almost a mystical, magical power, yeah, to do something to cause you to enter into the church of God, to become yes. a part of the church of God. The problem is that, again, it does not in the least line up with scriptures. Right. You will never find that in scripture. Scripture, it is always about, you believe in your heart, you confess with your mouth. There has yeah. to be this act of acceptance mm. on your part, that you understand what God has done for you, yeah. and you accept that. Now, the, the thing here is, there, the, we're, we're dealing with realms that are beyond our concept, because... Yeah. God is dealing with our spirit, not with our flesh. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay? Is it possible for your spirit to do that as an infant? Well, 
The answer to that is it has to be because John the Baptist was filled with the Holy Spirit while yet in his mother's womb. Mm -hmm. okay. All right? But the fact is when we start talking about baptism, as it is practiced in, you know, when we talk about, I use the term mainline denominations. Okay. You know what I'm talking about? The Anglican Church, the Church of England, the Roman Catholic oh, Church. Right, yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's mainline churches, right? Mm -hmm. now, now, you know, the Presbyterian Church, the Methodist Church. The, mm -hmm. Well, they're not mainline. No, they're not mainline. They're not, mainline. They're not considered mainline. Oh, no, they're they're right, evangelical. That's right, that's right. So, um, the, the point is, we, this is a, and this is the danger. This has become the, the tradition of man that is now the accepted practice of Christianity. Jesus Christ said, it's in the seventh chapter of Mark, he said to the Pharisees, the religious leaders, and I'm paraphrasing, he says, how nicely you set aside the commandments of God to hold fast to your traditions. And it all becomes about traditions. Yeah, what man has created. And he said, you're teaching the, the precepts of man as they were the commandments of God. And they're not. No. Right? I, I, here's a great example. And if you don't know this, I mean, you can, you can look it up. But in the ninth chapter of John, there's a story about a man who was born blind. Mm -hmm. All right? And Jesus heals this man who was born blind. Yes. And the man, now he's, been, he's blind from birth, and all of a sudden he can see, and it's causing a ruckus. Yeah. I mean, everybody that knows him is causing this gigantic ruckus, and it creates this incredible problem for the religious leaders. Because the religious leaders, this is attesting to the power of Jesus Christ. That's the last thing they want. So now what happens is, the Pharisees say of Jesus, we know this man is, a, they're talking to the blind man, they say, we know this man is a sinner. So how did he do this? Now, here's something really, really important. When they said, we know this man is a sinner, do you know that the Pharisees were convinced that Jesus was a sinner? Mm. Now, some of them, I, you know, this has got to be playing with their minds because they see his love. They see the power of God working through him, so it's creating a real conflict in them. But they say, we know he's a sinner. How did they know he was a sinner? I don't know. I'm going to tell you. Because they said he breaks the Sabbath. Yeah. He worked on the Sabbath, yeah. Okay? He was breaking what they saw as he's breaking the law. He's, if he's breaking the law, he's a sinner. That's by definition. The problem is, did Jesus break the law? No. The answer is, and the scripture is clear on this, no, never, not once, He's the only human that ever lived that never broke any part of the law. Mm. Never. He said that he didn't come to break the law. He destroyed the law. He came to fulfill it. Mm -hmm. He didn't break the law. He broke their tradition yes. about yes. the law. The tradition that they had built about the law. Mm -hmm. And they could no longer distinguish <clears throat> between their tradition and the commandment of God. Yeah. So when he broke their tradition, they, that, to them, that, that meant that he was a sinner. Mm, yeah. Because they could no longer distinguish, tell the difference between their traditions yeah. mm -hmm. and the law. Now today, and this is a fact, I don't know if you know anything about this at all, and it's not necessary that you know a lot about it, but the, the, the first five books of the Bible, that's called the law. From, that's Genesis Exodus, Deuteronomy, Numbers, Leviticus, I and mean, that's not in order, okay? Uh, it, it's called the Pentateuch in Greek, and it's called the Torah. Yeah, that's what Torah. the Jews call it, the Torah, yeah. right? Yeah. There's another book that is called the Talmud, and the Talmud is what Jews study today. The Talmud is what directs Jewish life today. The Talmud is a, a rabbinical commentary on the law. It's what, what Jewish theologians have to say about the law. But somewhere along the line, what Jewish theologians said about the law became more important than the law. Mm -hmm. And it became these traditions that they built about the law that supplanted the law. Mm -hmm. 
And this was going on in the life of Jesus. That's what he's talking about when he says, how nicely you set aside the commandments of God, the Talmud, I mean the, the Torah, to hold fast to your tradition, the Talmud. Well, we're doing the same thing today. We have wrapped Christianity up in so much tradition that people can't tell, you know, I don't, I don't celebrate Christmas. Uh, that's one thing, you know, uh, when, when Christians have a Christmas tree. You know. Well, see, you know, let's just do this really informally. Let me just explain something to you. Um, Christianity was a persecuted religion mm -hmm. for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. All right? Uh, it, it traveled out of Jerusalem, went into... Asia, which is Turkey, that's where, where like the seven churches of Revelation are in what modern day Turkey. It went to Greece. It went down into Egypt and Alexandria. Uh, and of course the Roman Empire is the world power. The, the world power. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of a lot of problems as the Roman Empire goes on into the second century and the third century. And Constantine becomes emperor. Have you ever heard of Constantine? Constantine. Yeah. 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 And all of a sudden, he declares that Christianity is a legal religion. And de facto makes it the state religion, the accepted religion. The reason he did this, and this is very, very clear, two things happened. They became very anti-Semitic, very anti-Jewish. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that was to take, because Christianity is a religion that doesn't have, the only, the only leader is Jesus Christ. Yeah. They proclaim that Jesus is Lord, where for three centuries they've been fighting because they've been required to proclaim that Caesar is Lord. Well, Constantine is the Caesar, okay? So and there's all these problems, political problems in the empire. So Constantine, well, he, they took away the Judaism because they, they wanted to be able to focus the power of the church in Rome. All right? Not in Antioch, not in, in Alexandria. Right? So Constantine makes Christianity the state religion for all intents and purposes. But still, the majority of the Roman world is pagan. Now, so how do you reconcile this? Well, you can't get Christians to change their mind. Not real Christians. Because Jesus is Lord and they'll not be moved. Pagans, on the other hand, almost by definition, they're very flexible. Because, hey, they've got hundreds of gods. What's one more? They don't care about Christians. That's right. Yeah. The only time they care about Christians is when Christians say there's only one God. As long as, as, long as, as, long as Christians are willing to just have another God, that's no problem. <laughs> so what Constantine does is he creates Christianity as the state religion, and then Christianity starts to adapt all of these pagan traditions and bring them in. Right. So the pagans yes. are comfortable with Christianity. Right. Yeah. And at that point in time, this is in the early 300s, Christianity all of a sudden changes entirely and becomes this compromised religion filled with pagan religion, with traditions. Yeah. Christmas is, if you study Christmas today, I mean, and you know, I'm not suggesting that you do this, but for example, you mentioned a tree. Yeah. You go to Jeremiah chapter 10 and see what it says about decorating trees. I mean, you know, th these are pagan traditions. That's why Jeremiah spoke against them. Uh, all of these things, there's, there's, no, there's no biblical reference, there's no frame of reference. The only thing I can tell you about Christmas is that it that wasn't December 25th. Mm -hmm. yeah. I can't tell you what day it was, but I can tell you what day it wasn't. <laughs> because it certainly wasn't that time of year. It just it doesn't. Christ was born. Okay? There were not three magi. It doesn't number, I mean, all of the traditions we built about, all of the things that Christians, and I'm speaking in general terms, believe about Christmas have no biblical root to them at all. The same thing is true of Easter. And you know, I mentioned this when I came here in the, be in the beginning, because I came here at Easter time. And it's fascinating if you look at this, because Easter is the name of a pagan goddess. Yes. That Jeremiah just rails against, absolutely rails against, and here we are with all of Christianity proclaiming the name of this pagan goddess and saying it's all about Jesus. It's that compromise that we have allowed, the traditions of men that we have wrapped around Christianity. Yeah. And it's like, do you, you ever see a picture of little Eskimo kids? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, you mean yeah. Okay. I mean they get they. It's cold. Yeah. Okay. So they wrap them up. They wrap them up. You know, and you see this little ball of fur walking across the ice. You know, you can't even tell if it's an animal. You can't tell what the kid is because it's. Well, you can't tell what Christianity is today because it's so bundled up yeah. Yeah. in traditions and garments. And that's why I use that, that, that verse from Zephaniah in the first chapter of Zephaniah. He says, he's going to punish the sons of the king. That's us. Because they have dressed themselves in foreign garments. We have clothed ourselves in foreign makes sense garments. Now. Yeah. Right. Right? So, so Christianity is, first of all, it is a restored relationship with God the Father through the atoning work of Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. powered by the Holy Spirit. Right. Yeah. It is second of all, what is the purpose of Christianity here? Uh, this is a question I have asked in literally a hundred congregations or more mm -hmm. around the world. I'll walk in and I'll say to them, how many of you here believe that God wants to bless you as much as He possibly can right now? And virtually, well, I, I, I've given you a hint, if I ask that question right here, how many, what do you believe right now that God wants to bless you as much as He possibly can right now? You say yes, you say yes, yes. you say yes. Well, I'm going to say no because, <laughs> yes, because I, you I'm know I'm saying no. Because <laughs> you said God has no respect for man. It's, yeah. it's for us to, to honor Him. Okay, wait, but, but here's, the, here's the real key to this. Okay, yeah. How could God bless you as much as He possibly can right this instant? There's only one way. Awesome. Take you home, man. Yes, okay. Yeah. Take yeah. you off this planet. Yes, get you out of this mess. Yes, yeah. Ultimate yeah. blessing. Yeah, that is. So if he was going to bless you as much as he possibly could, take him. he would take you out of here right now. Yeah. Yeah. That means that he is willing, he's willing for you to have less than the fullness of, of, of the life that looks that we have to look forward to. Yeah. Because he has a purpose for you being here. Yeah. So your being here right now is about his purpose. Yes. It is not about your purpose. What is his purpose? It's not, listen, it, it doesn't, so many, we're Buddhists for goodness gracious. <laughs> we're Hindus. It's saying, because we think, well, we're going to get to be better people and then we'll be qualified to go. You know, the minute you said yes to Jesus Christ, you're ready. You're qualified to go. You are righteous in the eyes of God. There's nothing that you can do is going to make you more righteous. Do you understand that? Not righteousness, the, the righteousness, righteousness make you any more righteous. right, let, let's define righteousness. Righteousness is being right with God the Father. Right. I believe that I was righteous the day when I let the Lord into my mouth. You were. Into my life, I'm sorry. But I feel that I've, I've dropped back possibly too far. I need to get back up and be righteous again because I feel that I've fallen well short of his standards. Okay, I, I can understand the feeling, okay. but you're wrong. Okay. okay. Well, good. I'm glad. No, no, and you should be. This, this is the good news of yeah. Jesus okay. Christ. Yeah. Your righteousness doesn't ever flow. No. Okay. Because righteousness, righteousness is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. It is the free gift of God. Okay. You are righteous. You are the Word of God says you are the very righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Okay. Now that doesn't mean that we're not, because righteousness and living good and living right are two separate issues. Yes. Okay? So your righteousness is accomplished by the work of God, not by your own work. Okay. Now, but you have a responsibility to put on the new man, to put off the old man, yes. to walk in love, to walk in the gifts. Of, these are all things that are part of that new life. But there's a reason for that. And the reason for that is not that you're more pleasing to God or that you are more qualified to go to heaven, because that is a lie from the pits of hell. Your reason for being here is, why has the world not ended today? I believe we're near the end, but why Why has the world not ended today? Just by the way, um, I read an article in Google, on Google News today, that there's some guy who believes with all of his heart that the world's going to end uh, on the 21st of this month. Yeah, just so you're aware. Get your order, affairs right. Okay. Why hasn't it ended today? I don't know. Because well, the, the plans have not been... Okay, but it says in the Bible. Because the, the, news, the good news needs to be preached everywhere. In the Absolutely. Everywhere, you see, yeah. it said, Jesus said in Matthew 24, He said, when the gospel, the good news of the kingdom of God is preached to all nations, 
then the end will come. Peter, in his second letter, says this. He says, in the last days, mockers will come with their mocking, saying, where is the promise of his coming? What happened? Why didn't he show up? Right? And God says, it's escaped their notice that this present world is reserved for destruction by fire. But God is patient, desiring that none should perish. Yeah. So he's waiting. So he's, there's somebody, there's some human being, I mean, this may sound you know, like a movie plot or something, there is some human being that either lives now or will live shortly who will literally be the last person to accept Jesus Christ. Yeah. You know, all these names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life from before the foundations of the earth. This is the last name in that book. Mm -hmm. when, that last, when that last person says, yes, Lord, there's no reason for anything to exist anymore. Yes. That's, I mean, this, you know, this sounds like a, a B-movie plot out of Hollywood, but that's a fact. So the purpose is that we bring that good news or show forth the good news to the lost. Yes. The purpose of church is to equip us to do that better. Yeah. Yeah. And I just can I just say something? And it doesn't, yes, you may, my daughter. It doesn't mean that uh, anybody that, <laughs> anybody that we speak with or share the good news. It doesn't mean that they'll on that spot say, yes, I accept Jesus. But, you but you've seed. given the opportunity. The Lord will not allow anybody to leave here without the opportunity of receiving or rejecting. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Right. right. So it doesn't mean that everybody you meet has to accept Jesus. Mm. You, oh. You've got to present right. them with the opportunity. So let me go back to my definition mm -hmm. of Christianity. Okay. Number one, okay, is that we are, the first thing that defines quote-unquote Christianity is our relationship with God the Father. The second thing is our purpose in being here, which is that we are the visible presentation of Jesus Christ to a lost and dying world. Mm -hmm. Paul said, Not I that live, but Christ that liveth within me. For I have died, and my life is hidden in Christ Jesus. Over and over and over. It's like, it's not about us. We are the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. So in us, I mean, the Bible, there's a, a thousand verses it proclaims. We bring the knowledge of the presence of Christ Jesus into every place. Mm -hmm. Our purpose on being here is we are ambassadors for Jesus Christ. Yes. Our purpose on being on this planet is not so you have a better job next year. Mm -hmm. Not so that you go better and you're more spiritual. Our purpose in being here is to present Jesus Christ to the world. Mm -hmm. That's our purpose. Mm -hmm. No other purpose. No other purpose than that. We each have different roles in doing that. Yeah. We each do that in different ways. But that's where the church comes into play. Mm -hmm. Okay? Because this is not something that, you know, and here, this is kind of a, a, a paradox, a dichotomy, call it what you want. We do this individually, but we do it as a body. <coughs> you know, it, it's in, and the part of doing it as a body is probably more important than doing it individually. Mm -hmm. Jesus in the garden on the night before when he was taken, okay? He went into the garden and he prayed. He prayed to such an extent that he literally sweat blood. Yeah. He prayed that we would be one. One of the things he said that he prayed that we would be one so that the world would know that the Father had sent him. Mm -hmm. Our unity shows Jesus Christ. You believe that? Yes. Yeah. Then believe this. How this unity hides Jesus Christ. No, I agree with that. Can't have one side of that coin without the other. Mm. And the church is so divided that we hide Jesus Christ from the world right now. Mm. That's why it is so important to bring a message to the, to the church right now that we need to repent and get on with being what Christianity is supposed to be. Mm. Mm. So, our purpose in being here, and this is this is not an oversimplification. This is just this is the the grand picture, mm. is that we present Jesus Christ to a lost and dying world. Yeah. We do that by imitating Jesus Christ. And that imitation of Jesus Christ is part of the restoration that God is doing in our lives. God, it says in Genesis chapter 1, made man in his own image. We were designed to look like Jesus Christ from the very, very beginning. Then Adam sinned, and he didn't look like Jesus no more. And then Adam gave birth, and he gave birth after his own kind. So now people are being born, they don't look like Jesus. They look like Adam. 
So Jesus comes along and restores that. He gives us new life, new birth. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now we're born again, and we have that new spiritual life. The unfortunate part is, and this is what I was going to talk about in Lazarus, when God calls Lazarus out of the tomb, Jesus stands in front of a tomb and says, Lazarus, come forth. Lazarus comes forth, but he still stinks of death, and he is still wrapped in the cloth of death. Well, when we came into new life, well, not, we still stink of death, and we're still dressed up in our robes of death. So we have to get those off us. This is the function of the church. The church comes together. And God appoints in the church apostles, prophets, evangelists, and pastors, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of service until we all attain to the unity of Jesus Christ, is what it says, because in that unity we show forth Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's interesting when you said that the, the church has to unwrap it. And when he said, unbind him and let him go. It's not, he didn't say, Lazarus, take off those. Right. Those, it had to be you know, that body, a yeah. function of the yeah. body of believers. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, this is, it's really, if you stop and think about it, it's incredibly simple. It really is. Mm -hmm. we, we, you know who overcomplicates it? Religion. Yeah, the church. You know why? Because religion is, and always has been, the enemy of spirituality. Because religion, and I'm talking about formal religion, and I don't care whether we're talking about Christian religions, Jewish religion, Babylonian religions, they have, what Jesus Christ did is He connected you to God the Father. Well, you know, you know why this scares the Catholic Church? Because they got a priest who's supposed to connect you. You can't get to Jesus Christ directly. You've got to go through the priest, you've got to go through the saints, you've got to go through Mary. There's somebody that's standing between you and God. Well, the problem is when you get when you truly get born again, when you truly understand understand what God has done for you, there's only one intercessor. That's what the Word of God says between us and the Father, and that is the man Christ Jesus. So we now the veil was torn from top to bottom in the Holy of Holies when Christ died upon the cross. It says we can go with confidence before the throne of grace. Jesus Christ has made it possible for us to go straight to the Father. But you know what? Where does that leave religion? Where does that leave all of the professional priests? Where does that leave all the professional pastors in the church today? Who basically are saying to you, you need me. You can't get to the Father. You're not going to understand the God. You're not going to understand the things of God. You're not going to have a right relationship with God unless you come through me. We're doing the same thing in the evangelical and the charismatic church and the Pentecostal church that the other religions have done for, for centuries. We're building up this tradition that places some barrier between the average believer. Because once you're saved, you have the right. I don't care how long you've been saved. I don't care what you look like on the outside. I don't care how young you are or how old you are. I don't care whether you're white or black, whether you're Jew or Gentile, or whether you're slave or free. You have been given the right to go boldly before the throne of grace, come right into the presence. Not only come into His presence, but to come running into His presence, throw your arms around Him and cry out, Abba, Daddy. Well, you know what? The professional priesthood doesn't like that. Mm -hmm. They want you to have to go through them to get there. That's what religion does. It puts barriers between man and God. It doesn't bring men to God. It creates barriers between God and man. It's always done that. They are the ones who have the mystery power. Listen, I, I, this may sound anti-Catholic, but that's because it is. The, the thing is, the Catholic Church, the entire Catholic Church, is centered on one event. That event is the, what they call the Eucharist. Right? You know this, right? Eucharist. The Holy, the Holy Communion. Yeah. Eucharist. Yeah. Because in the, in the Catholic Church, this may not be true in C of E. Okay, because okay, this was one of the issues with Martin Luther, and it comes into such a ridiculous thing. Cons transubstantiation and consubstantiation. The Catholic Church believes that when the priest takes the bread and says the, his prayer over it, he literally, literally changes that piece of bread into the body of Jesus Christ. Okay. They believe that. Yes. Yeah. Literally. But we don't because it says we break this 
bread in remembrance. That's consubstantiation. Right. Okay. That was the and great that's, debate. That's yes. what the, uh, we were, uh, the Church of England does. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. That, that's what I say. It's a, okay. I understand that. Fine. But the thing was that what happens is you have to. Ha he has. He has these this power of magic words. Yes. Where he can do this thing that nobody else can do. That's what a priest can do. And the right. wine gets changed into the blood. Right. No, it's not the case. But by the same token, even in C of E and other Anglican churches mm -hmm. and so forth, that priest stands as an intercessor or a yeah. barrier, depending on which yes. word you want to use. Yeah. Okay, but here's what, you know, the, the Catholic Church says that Peter was the first pope. Mm -hmm. And that he was infallible. Mm -hmm. Well, here's what he said. He said that we, all believers, we are a chosen generation. We are a royal priesthood. Right. We're all, we are the royal priesthood. That You see, because there's only one high priest, and his name is Jesus Christ. Yeah. And he has appointed us all as yeah. priests. Right. So that we can all go before God the Father, making sacrifices of praise and thanksgiving <coughs> yeah. and honoring him. We don't need somebody to do that on our behalf. And we are the saints. Yeah. And we are the saints. You know, I mean, the whole process of sainthood in the Catholic Church is just, you know, it's, it's amazing. It's amazing. But the, the only time that saints, the word saints is used in the Bible, it, it's a, it is referencing any believer in Jesus Christ who's been restored to the Father. So the great danger has always been religion. Whether it was, whether it was the Babylonians trying to build a tower to reach into heaven on their own, mm -hmm. they're trying to achieve a relationship with God, Without Jesus Christ? Is that going through, like saying that they were going through the back door? Well, it was. They were trying to. Yeah. They're yeah, trying. Yeah. They're trying to create their own way of reaching God. Mm -hmm. When Jesus Christ said that He is the way, mm -hmm. and nobody gets to God with, except through Him. Mm -hmm. You can't build your own tower. You can't build your own religion. You can't make your own rules to get a right relationship with God the Father. Mm -hmm. It will not work. It cannot work. And he said this. But those are the traditions of men. And we have, you know, it's what happens is we have built... One of the, one of the ways you get traditions is because they're comfortable. Yeah. You know, you you walk in, you know exactly what you're going to expect. Right. There's going to be... Your ways, you know? sure. Because that's, that's comfortable. Right. That's right. People like that. <coughs> they, don't, they don't like challenge and confrontation. Mm -hmm. You can go into church, and depending on the church you go into you will find that there's a fairly set pattern. Three songs, an announcement, a sermon, a collection, and a, a, a cup of coffee and yeah, a cake, and yeah, off you go. Yeah. Yeah. Or, you know, or it's a pipe organ in the choir. But you know why? Because it's comfortable to do that. Yeah, you know what to expect. Yeah. You know that you can get... I, I know what restaurants you have here in the U.S. I always use it. It's like we'll, we'll all be in Red Lobster in time. You know, we'll get out, we'll get, we know we'll get out in time for lunch. Well, in the early church, when they came together and prayed, they didn't know when they were ever going to get out. <laughs> because they didn't get out until the Holy Spirit moved and told them to go. Right. What happens is, a real relationship with Jesus Christ, and this is what I preached about here Sunday, is dangerous. Mm -hmm. Because it's uncomfortable. It attacks your flesh. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. it, will, it will constantly challenge you to greater growth. Constantly challenge you. If you would shake it. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I was thinking, this is probably, I probably shouldn't even record this, but I was thinking about this today. Um, back in the day, there was a time when Alice and I first got married, I was into martial arts. I was, you know, I used to be in good shape before I had my accident. And I was in, I was very fit. Triathlete. And uh, I was into all kinds of stuff. And I, but I, I, so I have kind of an appreciation of, I was a warmonger. Now, I repented that, see. But that's the way I was. When I was in the military, I was, let's, let's attack everybody. Let's yeah. blow it. Let's just go to war and blow everybody up. Yeah. Uh, not quite following the Prince of Peace, don't you see? Mm -hmm. Well, you didn't know it. No. The fact of the matter is, and that's why I say this is not probably a good analogy, but you know they got Bin Laden. Yeah. yeah. The word they needs to be more clearly defined. President Obama didn't pick up a gun and go trotting off into Pakistan. I can promise you he wasn't about to. 99.9% um, .9 of the U.S. military didn't go trotting off into Pakistan. A very, very, very few, very elite warriors 
went into a nation that was unfriendly to them, yeah. where they knew they would get no support if they got caught, mm -hmm. and went in and did this. Those are the people. <coughs> I, I had the opportunity to know when I was in the Navy, because that's a long, long time ago. They, we didn't have the SEALs. The SEALs were just coming. You know what the SEALs are? The Navy SEALs? That's the group that went in. So the commandos. The oh, right. yeah, yeah. The SAS. Yeah, yeah. Right. And even within the SAS, you know, I believe that there's an, there's an elite. There's an elite within the elite. Yes. Yeah. They're yeah. called the Special Boat so, Squadron. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. I knew some of those guys. You know, it's like, but these are the guys. When you want something done, you want it done right. You call on them. Yeah. Why are they the elite? Because they're willing to pay the price. Mm -hmm. They literally go through, and this is a, a worldly term. They go through hell mm -hmm. to qualify. And the vast majority of people that try to qualify never, never make it. Because it's such a grueling, grueling process. We're supposed to be that warrior class. We're supposed to be that warrior class because we are involved in a life and death struggle on this planet. If somebody doesn't accept Jesus Christ, it's like, okay, well, that's just another person. We're not going to get into our church. They're not going to come. They're not going to tithe. They're not going to be another body on earth. That's somebody that could die for all eternity. This is life and death, it is warfare. The church is supposed to be that elite force. It takes the same thing, if not more, to be elite spiritually than it does to be special boat squadrons or commandos. It is sacrifice and sacrifice and hardship and hardship. You don't have that comfort. You don't, you don't sit around and just you know, wall and be fat and happy. You've got to be doing that all the time. The kind fact of the of the that it does. But the fact of the matter is, that's what Christianity is supposed to be. Because it is what Jesus Christ was. Think about Jesus saying, The foxes have dens, the bird of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Yeah. Think of Paul saying, remember I talked about this Sunday, you know, in, in that sermon. He said that he was cold and hungry. He was beaten. He was shipwrecked. shipwrecked. He spent nights in the deep. Mm -hmm. This is a man, that, a, a little Jewish tent maker, who turned the world upside down mm -hmm. because he was willing to pay the price, not just to follow Jesus, but to imitate Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's what Christianity is supposed to be. But we have turned it into a great, comfortable, fat beast. And because of that, it is filled with people who are probably not Christians.